If you are taking AP English List, you're in the right place. I'm John from Marco Learning, joined by Heather Garcia. How are you doing tonight, Heather? Doing well. How are you? Good. We've got all these crammers trying to change their <laughs> AP score for AP English Lit in the last few seconds. You cannot do that, but we can give you some tips to help you center what you're going to be doing. Some of you do have more hours. All our West Coast people, you have some more time. Um, some of you are going to be watching the recording. I encourage you, if you like this video, press the like button, subscribe to our channel, check out all the links in our description. I want to show you a few that I'm sharing with you all right now. Um, one is our study guide pack. If you've got a few hours, this is a great place to go. This is the AP English Lit study guide pack. You click on this. It takes you to these really cool study guides some of which cover, cover concepts. You may not have time for that cramming. So you wanna to go to the test preppy parts, which are down here. Things like, I'm gonna scroll all the way down to the bottom. Things like how to hack the multiple choice. Um, that's really useful. How to look at wrong answers on the multiple choice. Things like the poetry analysis. How do you break down your time on that Q1 poetry analysis? How do you break time, time down on Q2 prose fiction? How do you handle this argument essay? We're not going to get to all these things tonight. These are available for you. We've also got a full-length practice test. Do not take a full-length practice test the night before, but if it's only 632 over in your neck of the woods, you can try the multiple choice, even just one passage, and look at the answers and explanations. This is for free on our website. Also, if you're really bored, you can watch our entire giant playlist with Heather, Elena Vernon, me covering each part of the exam all the way from top to bottom, including poetry. So check out those resources, everyone. They're available to you. I posted the link in the description. Let us know where you're coming from, how nervous you are. Heather and I are here to answer your questions. So definitely post those questions that you've got in the chat. Great to see you, Paul, Wendell, uh, Jake, Avery. Thank you guys for being supporters and um, let us know how we can help. So Heather, I'm gonna turn it over to you. What are some of the things that we're gonna go over in tonight's session? So we're gonna spend a little time looking at that poetry study guide and just talking about some um, multiple choice tips just in general. And then we're gonna be looking at writing because if multiple choice is 45% of your overall test and reading comprehension kind of is what it is at this point, our writing skills are things that can really be changed and are really malleable at this point and can affect 55% of our test. So that's where we're gonna focus most of our energy. Great. So I'm going to let you share your screen, Heather. I'll be here answering questions in the chat. Thank you guys for joining and good luck on the test. Thank you. Okay. So I'm sharing. I think I'm sharing. Right. Oh, no. I want to. Oh, gosh. I'm having a moment. Oh, why is this not? Okay. I'm going to just leave it right the way it is because that's I'm perfect the way it is. Perfect. Here we go. AP Literature Final Test Tips, guys, we are one day before the test, and at this point, it has been a tough, tough 2020. Like, I get it. We are trying to decide whether we're dealing with allergies or whether we are dealing with AP sessions, and I'm telling you that the memes are going to be worth it when we get out of this test on the other side tomorrow. But in the meantime, we're going to make sure that we are looking at some of our multiple choice skills. So... This is one of the things that I think AP kids struggle with the most is that this is not a 100% answer kind of test. This isn't sitting down to take a final exam with your teacher where you get 100% and it's a grade of 100% A. College Board is giving you 55 multiple choice questions to answer in an hour. And that doesn't even include the reading that you have to do. They don't expect you to get 100%. There's no expectation of that. And I think that taking that pressure off of ourselves is really, really important. So if you are able to get 70% of them right, right, take that pressure of 100% off. And I think that that is going to alleviate a lot of concern, which will let you think a little bit more clearly. And then every question is weighted the same. So if you're sitting there taking the test and there is a question that is just freaking you out, move on, right? Put a little mark beside it, pick a letter and just go because you don't have time to spend three minutes on one question when all of the others are weighted exactly the same. Narrow it down, take a great guess and just get going. 
And then when you're looking at these passages, read the questions first, because if you've got a poem there and it's from the 1800s and you've got 12 questions and question 11 is like, hey, where do you find the transition where it moves into hope? What line gives you that transition? You're like, oh, oh, there's hope in here. All right, I better find the hope, right? Because it gives you direction as you're reading. So looking at those questions can really help guide you, especially in a time scenario, because my goodness, do we need that? That direction can really help us. And then this is the multiple choice, just a really quick snip of that study guide that John was showing you a few minutes ago, where we're looking at those question types because College Board is really, with the AP Lit test, pretty predictable about what they're going to ask. So they're going to ask you about the narrator or the speaker, and they're going to ask you to describe him or her or to explain the effect of that first or third person narration, especially if there's any shifts. And if there's a narrator who's unreliable, oh my goodness, I can promise you College Board is going to ask about it because they do enjoy that. They also like anything that deals with complexity. So if a character or a narrator is going to kind of rub against itself and they're going to say one thing but do another, it's probably really important because College Board loves complexity. And that does create a complex narrator or speaker or character, right? Because if they're asking about characters, we know that characters have arcs. We know that those character arcs change and that the character is going to make some sort of transition. So if they do, College Board's going to want to know about it. They're going to ask. It's something you should pay attention to as you are diving into a multiple choice passage or a passage that you're reading for the essays as well. If they're comparing and contrasting multiple characters, I think that that, or you have characters interacting in any way, just assume they're going to ask you how their reactions to the same scenario are going to reveal different characteristics about them. Because College Board is incredibly intentional about what they choose as far as materials. Those materials that they pull are going to be really rich in characterization because that is a majority of the CED, the course exam description, is focusing on characterization. Give me a lot there. They're going to ask you about plot and structure. And one of the details in here, if you look at that fourth bullet point, remember this all came from the study guide that you have, but it says describe how meter or rhyme contribute to the structure of the poem. They're not asking you if it's iambic or trochaic or um, they're not asking those things, if it's pentameter or octometer, like they don't care. They just want to know if it contributes to the structure or if it contributes to the meaning. So that takes a little bit of the pressure off and allows you to really focus on the intent behind the poem, the meaning behind the poem, rather than getting caught up in the minutia of it. Like you should not be counting I am's during this test. That is not what this test is. Maybe in the 80s it was, but it's not now. And then same with knowing the definitions of zygma and metonymy and synecdoche. And my goodness, I think I always mix those two up. Don't worry about it. College Board isn't so concerned with you knowing the minutia of those terms. Don't spend your time tonight studying vocabulary. You are going to be way better served spending your time looking at whatever novels you've prepped for question three and maybe looking at the historical context. Be like, hey, when was this written? All right. Yeah, it's in this time period. That's a better use of your time than trying to study all of the different metrical feet and what they are, right? Because that's just not the way this test is structured. And so I do think that's important to note, guy, you know, going into these last couple of hours before the test. And then questions about style. These questions, I think, always tend to trip kids up because they're asking you to think about the function or the effect effect of a specific word, right? They're asking you to kind of put yourself into a generic reader sense or even sometimes acting as the author, like trying to predict what the author's intent was and explaining the symbolism or the imagery, right? So what is the purpose behind it? And then look at the um, terms that they give in that last bullet point for questions about style. They want to know Similes, metaphors, personification, illusion, these devices that we're all really, really comfortable with. So going into the multiple choice test for AP Lit shouldn't be a super strenuous exercise. It's not like cramming information in for like a chem test or something where there's like formulas and I don't know, equations. This here though, from the multiple choice study guide, 
where we're looking at types of wrong answers. This is huge because if you have a question and you're trying to narrow down and use process of elimination, which you totally, totally should, you need to know which pieces to kind of get rid of, right? So if you're looking at test options and you can start eliminating those ones that are wrong, that's helpful. So any answer choice that's just way, way too literal, you want to try to avoid these because if it is a super literal definition of a word that appears in the passage, but it's kind of out of context for the passage, it's probably not the right answer. And then one of the ones that I see College Board do so often is the recycled language. They'll pull language from somewhere else in the passage and you're like, oh, I remember reading that. Yes, that has to be the right answer. It's probably not. Look at it in the context. Make sure that it fits the idea of what the question is and they're not just throwing in recycled language to trick you because they will. They're tricky. Um, looking for answers that are partly true, right? So like one part of it is totally right, but then there's that other part where you're just like, eh. Right, chances are that's probably not the right answer. And then anything that's going to have that extreme language, those absolutes where there are no exceptions. Well, there's always exceptions. We know that. So chances are that's not the right answer. And so by eliminating some of these, you can really get yourself down to the answer choice that is more correct. Right. Okay. Let's kind of transition our focus here to the essays because the multiple choice questions, like I had said before, are 45% of your test and they're not really things that you can study and prep for. Whereas the writing portion of the test is 55% and you can make little tweaks in your writing that can really change the way you're writing looks to a reader. So as an AP reader, one of the things that I look at first when a test pops up on the screen, right, because it's a virtual reading, I look at the size of the paragraphs. I can't help it, right? It's a text. It's typed. It's right in front of me. I love when it's typed. Um, sometimes it isn't. But when it is and it's right in front of me, I'm looking like, are your paragraphs here or are they here? And if they're here, are there 10 of them? Because by golly, I hope so. If they're here, maybe there's three, maybe there's two right? If they're big, who knows? But that size of the paragraph genuinely matters. And then this article was written by one of our Marco teachers, Michelle Lindsay. And what she did, she went back through the 2016 to the 2019 release tests on College Board, and she analyzed and kind of did like a really deep dive into what made these high-scoring essays really work? What made them get those high scores? And so she went through a process where she combed through the tests and she collected all this data and she wanted to really see what made them tick. So this is the chart. And if you want to kind of zoom in and linger on this chart, it's on our marker learning website under all of the articles. And it was just published on April 20th. So it's a pretty new publication. So this is for essay number one for AP Lit, the poetry essay. And so looking at that poetry essay, the introductions for high scoring essays from 2016 to 19 were about 57 to 96 words long. So not overly long, but look at them in contrast to the conclusions. Anywhere from 26 words to 112, that is a huge range, but they're all high scoring. Cause you know what? There is not a category on the rubric for your conclusions. So it can be 26 words long, and not be a big deal. But those intros all fall into a little bit of a tighter category. And really in the intro, you're establishing context, working your way towards sophistication. But what you really need in that intro is the single point for the thesis. Like that is where you really need to focus your energies. But let's look at what some of these high scoring essays did. They were putting into context the main issue or topic presented in the poem, and they provided a one sentence summary of the poem. But not only that, they really set the argument up to be defensible, and they made sure that their thesis not only answers all the layers of the prompts, but also hits a why, right? Why is this poem important? Why is this poem timely? Why is this thesis worthy of evaluation, right? Getting into the so what of the essay itself, right? Of the poem itself. And then their thesis statement is gonna take a nod to some sort of thematic idea. 
if the poem is about hope and the persistence of the human spirit, then they're going to mention that in their thesis statement, right? Because they can always talk about the author's use of poetic techniques to build a tone, but how much greater is it if they're using the author's use of poetic techniques to build a tone of hope so that the ultimate theme of humanity's thriving through I don't know, destruction is going to be highlighted, right? The idea is to really pull out that theme in that thesis statement. And that's what these high scoring essays have done. And then look at the body paragraphs. What I like about this, so each body paragraph is going to nod back to that theme, right? They're constantly referencing it, constantly developing it. Theme is the cornerstone of these high scoring essays. And each body paragraph is going to focus on the effect on the readers and the author's purpose. Your essays shouldn't be character driven or um, speaker driven. They should be author driven. They are authorial intent focused. What was the intent of the author when they wrote this? What was the effect on readers supposed to be? That's where your energies need to be focused. And then look at the third bullet point for body paragraphs. Relevant quotes are used several times within each body paragraph. Not once, not twice, several, several quotations working their way through the paragraphs. And then look at that fourth one. Quotes used are dissected and words are analyzed within the quotes included, meaning there's layers of analysis. So they're pulling an excerpt from the passage, but then they're not only talking about that excerpt as a whole, they're narrowing it down to the granular word level and saying, okay, within that quote that I've already analyzed, let's dive really deep and look at this word because this word is really interesting, right? So they're still talking about the quote, but then they're talking about it again on a micro level. And having that layered level of analysis was pushing these essays higher up in the sophistication points and giving them higher scoring. And that advice just in itself, I think, can really be transformative in your writing. Um, these essays... I really like the fifth or sixth bullet down. It says most essays use more than three quotes or direct references up to seven in each body paragraph, right? There's more than three. There's four, there's five, there's six, there's seven different tiny little micro quotes within these body paragraphs. Th those are some big paragraphs, right? Those are not short and sweet and getting the job done and moving on. These are really well elaborated. So whenever you kind of think that you've reached a breaking point, look for another piece of evidence. Look for one more piece of evidence. Just keep going. Because two really great body paragraphs are probably going to be more impressive than five little ones, right? According to this chart. And really as an AP reader, like, yeah, I get it. I'm there. Um, never forget that there is always an intended audience for these pieces. These pieces weren't written in isolation. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been published, right? Like, they were meant for public consumption. So keeping that in mind, like what was the purpose? What did they want to get out of the publication of that piece? Okay, we're gonna dive over to the conclusion because of course you can always pull these charts up and look at them um, on your own right from the Marco website. And the conclusions we already talked about can have a big range for word counts, but notice that they always end with that overall so what for the poem. They try to wrap it up in a way that really mirrors that opening and talking about what the author actually achieved in the poem. Like we know what their purpose is. We've been talking about it all along. It's fine to reiterate it, but what was the actual end result? And then what were the reader's takeaways? So oh, this is another one that does exist on the Marco website. This one was published nine days later, and it's looking at question three. The question two doesn't exist. There isn't a chart for question two yet, but question three does. And this one's focusing on that open response. Notice when you get to choose your own piece of literature, how much bigger and meatier those introductions are, right? They're up to 133 words. Why? historical context. Historical context leads the charge when it comes to introductions with question three. 
because we know the work we can write about in advance. If I were to give you a pop quiz right now, and I said right now on a post-it note on your desk, tell me the top two books that you think you could write about on the test tomorrow. I'm willing to bet you can because you've studied them in your course. Well, now that you know that you've studied them in your course, maybe tonight, just really quickly look at the year it was published, right? Do a quick little Google search and be like, hey, what was happening in the world in this year? What was happening in the country where this was written in that year? What big political movements were happening? Does it matter with my book? Probably. Right? I mean, it's kind, of, it's kind of how literature works, right? It's a reflection of the life that's around it. So in question three, that is what, that's the only thing you can study for this test, really. And that's what they're bringing in to this chart that you didn't see in the other one is that historical context. Like, look at the introduction, the second bullet point. Only the context of the book mentioned is in relation to the prompt and the connection between the prompt and the book. So they're not just saying that the book takes place at this particular time in history and abandoning it. They're weaving it into the theme. So that is important to note, right? Okay. So the scoring rubrics for AP literature, right? So we have, and they're all the same for all three essays. So you have that thesis point at the top, row A, and you need to make sure that you are definitely, definitely earning this thesis point, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But this thesis point, oh my goodness, if you don't have a strong thesis, it's going to be really challenging, not impossible, but challenging to get a four in evidence and commentary because that hub of your essay is missing. That deep thematic piece isn't there. And so when that thematic piece is missing, it's really hard to get all of your evidence to tie back to a point that doesn't exist. Um, so that's why it's important to make sure that you get that thesis point at the beginning. And you do this by really addressing the prompt and being specific. If the prompt is asking you how the author uses poetic techniques to establish a tone, and you tell me that the author uses poetic techniques to establish a unique tone, well, why? I mean, you just repeated the prompt. You didn't actually give me anything to work with. And then your essay is going to kind of reflect that a little bit. It's going to be just a little less focused than it could be if you had specifically addressed the prompt, right? And then looking at evidence and commentary, let's go straight to that four point column. So the evidence is gonna be specific and relevant and the commentary is gonna offer support for every claim. It's gonna be a well-organized line of reasoning, which means that it has a hub at the beginning, right? A thesis. It's gonna explain the significance of specific words and details, which we saw on the chart. And it's going to explain the writer's literary techniques with multiple examples that are tied to interpretation, right? It's all fitting within that chart when we look at the rubric here. And then that final row is the sophistication. Demonstrate sophisticated thinking. Hello, focus on the complexity because complexity is sophisticated. If you can point it out and notice it, if you can see that a character is thinking one thing but doing another, or one character wants one thing, one character wants another, and now there's a conflict regarding it. Well, that is incredibly important to note. And then place that interpretation into a larger context, right? That's that historical context. So here is the poetry prompts rubric, the prose, which is identical, roughly, and then the literary argument, right? They all follow that same exact structure. So now, if you're gonna be taking the test digitally, right? This doesn't work if you're taking it in person tomorrow. But if you're taking it digitally in a couple weeks, there is a really quick and easy checklist that you may wanna just kind of jot down and keep near you, right? So at the end of your essay, did you remember to include a thesis that's defensible and focuses on a pur purpose? Did you remember to bring theme in early? In your body paragraphs, did you have clear transitions? Did you smoothly integrate your quotes or just plop them in there and hope for the best? Did you ensure that all that commentary kind of ties back to the thesis and the purpose, right? Are you making two or three distinct points in your paragraphs? And then um, did you end with the main theme in the closing? And then some verbs to consider for author's purpose, like the author juxtaposes these two characters in order to highlight the differences between them because blah, 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 right? The author highlights 
this character's rebelliousness in order to emphasize this character's desire to do good and you know whatever these verbs should be used for the author not the characters these essays are not character driven they are author driven authorial intent that's where we want to be landing and then as you are focusing on each of your three essays, if you just have a little chart like this set up and sitting beside you, even if you set it up on your actual AP paper when you dive in there, although you shouldn't need to if you're annotating, but if you're taking it digitally, right? You wanna keep your thesis captured in a place where you can go back and reference it often. And as you are reading, since you can't take notes on the actual screen itself, there is no annotation feature, you can just kind of jot down, okay, so in the line number, this is happening and this is why it's important, right? Just a way to kind of keep your ideas in line as you are diving through this test. So now let's look really at some more um, specific writing tips. And oh my gosh, I have so many, but you're just going to stick with me. It's going to be super. So when you're writing thesis statements, here are some common mistakes. So a thesis that just kind of summarizes the poem or the story, right? It's kind of lame, um, not a lot's happening. A thesis statement that doesn't fully address the prompt, right? It covers one half but not the other half, or that only summarizes the prompt, which I had given you an example of earlier. So when you're writing thesis statements, how to write them solidly is that you make sure that you cover all portions of the prompt. You make sure that it's debatable and you are super, super specific so that you're not just saying the author uses devices to give a tone. No, you're telling me what devices and what tone and what the purpose was. Um, always try to include that overarching purpose or theme and it can be more than one sentence, the rubric said so. So some helpful tips as you're writing and as you're just going in general. You can always reference the narrator or the speaker, but you probably shouldn't reference the main character because that just doesn't quite sound as sophisticated. And it might not be authentic because you're usually only getting excerpts. Uh, as an AP reader, I kept seeing like this passage is confusing or this passage was hard to understand. However, and then they would keep going. Stop it. Don't do that. Like, yeah, that's complex. That's why College Board picked it. But you can say it's complex. You can say it's sophisticated. You don't have to. But if you're feeling compelled to, like, justify and say that it was hard, like, head that direction instead. And then one of the things that kind of drives, I think, AP Lit teachers crazy in general is when we see students write, the author uses diction. Cool. You just told me the author uses words right? Because diction is words and I'm using words and you use words and everybody uses words. I would rather hear you say that the author uses elevated diction or heated diction or diction that strikes rebellious tones, right? Like, so give me something else to go with. Don't just say it's diction. And I like it better if you can say that the author's use of elevated diction serves to demonstrate to readers that they come from a higher socioeconomic background and could afford proper education, right? Like give me a context, give me a purpose behind it. And then have a theme statement in your thesis, please. Don't just summarize the plot, that's bad, don't do that. So a few more helpful writing tips. Most of the points in the rubric are earned in the body of the paragraphs, right? So the body paragraphs. So that means that your intro should be short and sweet. If you're spending 25 minutes writing the best introduction that anybody has ever read in the history of the world, you're still only getting one point. That's it, because if you don't move on and you don't write other things, there's nothing else to score you on. So you have to make sure that you're balancing your time appropriately. Get an introduction down. If you feel like you might wanna go back and amplify it later, leave a few, lines before and after it so that you can go back and add in things if you have time and you're doing it on paper so that you can travel back and forth between your essays but if not just keep it short and move on to your body paragraphs and then really spend some time developing those because that's where the majority of your points are going to be earned and then uh, ensure that your thesis does more than just restate the prompt and your intros can be short right three sentences that's all you need your conclusions, remember, we saw one on that chart that was 26 words long. That's nothing. You can wrap that conclusion up at the end of your body paragraph if you feel like you need to. It doesn't have to be its own entity. It can just be a natural closing, especially if you get to the point where you are running out of time with any particular essay. Because if you spend all 
of your hour, your two hours on one essay. And it is the best essay that you've ever written. And it was perfect. And it took you two hours and you are so proud. You might've gotten a six out of six, right? But you just missed the opportunity for 12 points because you didn't get to the other two essays, right? So you need to make sure that you are utilizing your time wisely, spacing it out wisely, that you're not lingering too long in any one test or any one portion of the test. And one of the things that I also notice as an AP reader is that students will just kind of mention that there's a symbol or a theme or a detail and they'll talk about that theme and they'll explain to me what that theme is. But, but that's kind of it. They just stop there and they're like, I found a theme and this was it. Or I found a symbol and this was it. And that's fine, but that's not telling me what it does. Like, what does that theme or symbol do? Tell me how it adds meaning. That is what makes me care as an AP reader. And then address all of the components of the prompt in relation to that added meaning, right? Make sure that it's always connecting. And then when you're looking at question three, my goodness, please tell us the title of the book or the play and the author in that first paragraph. I can't tell you how many times students of my own would forget that in my classroom. Like, come on, write it down. Tell me who you're referencing here. And your thesis obviously is going to focus on that overall meaning, but if you don't explain that in your examples and you don't constantly tie back to that thesis with overall meaning, like every body paragraph should tie back to that thesis. If that isn't happening, then you're missing an opportunity to really ground for your readers that you have a deeper understanding of this text. So if you're thinking that your analysis needs to be five lines long, maybe we should double that, right? Maybe if it's supposed to be three, you double it to six, right? And you do that by tying it back to whatever your thesis statement is and whatever your overall meaning is, right? You say what you were going to say about your quote, and then you bring it back to that initial hub of the essay. And then one of the things that College Board really likes to do, really likes to do is put in some kind of deep thinking metaphors, right? So that poem that they had a few years back, it's called Juggler. It's about this guy who's juggling these balls in the air and he ends up juggling plates and spoons and tables and then everything comes crashing down and everybody claps as they watch him basically just like collapse in a heap of all of the things that he tried to build. It, it could be literal. There could be a literal juggler with tables and chairs and brooms. Chances are it's a deeper metaphor for how we really like to watch people as they put on this spectacle and then how we react when they crash and burn, right? So probably something a little deeper happened in there. College Board isn't really giving us a poem about an actual juggler as much as they are about the human experience. So if we forget to look at what College Board gives us as a metaphor, we can kind of get trapped in a lot of just the literalness of the pieces, especially in a timed setting, because goodness, we're stressed out. Like it's, it's a timed test, but you have to try to force yourself into that metaphorical space for sure. And while you're thinking about that, try to think figuratively, try to look for some of these universal archetypes. Are you noticing in the multiple choice, like that there's a distinction between light and darkness? Are you noticing it in the essay passages? Because that might be something really interesting to write about as far as complexity goes. And then look at the contrast between fire and ice. It may not be literal fire and ice. It might be a character who is incredibly heated in an argument and another character who is icy in response. Right. What does that dichotomy have to say about the way that they interact with one another? Um, same with like the heaven versus hell. It doesn't have to be actual physical places. It could be somebody who is high up on a mountain and somebody who's like down in a bog in the time machine by H.G. Wells. Oh, gosh, he has that, too. But also in his book, um, The Island of Dr. Moreau, it shows up with like the mountains and the valleys. Right. And being kind of heavenly helly. Same with that ascension and descension. Um, feathers or birds being lightness and speed and escape and freedom. Um, anything that's like shadowy is supposed to be kind of mysterious. Um, masks, whether they're physical or metaphorical, right? The idea is concealing. So if somebody, a character feels one emotion but shows another one, right? What are they concealing and why is that concealment important? 
right? Remember, that's always that ticket. And then boats and rafts with like safe passage and then windows and doors with thresholds and transitions. If somebody is looking at an open door and then turns away from it and doesn't walk through it, what opportunity are they missing? If they're looking at an open window, but they don't actually like close it or open it or stretch a hand out or do anything with it, is that an opportunity that they're missing or that they're longing for, right? Just things to consider as you are reading. And then keeping in mind that we do have that checklist there for you before you just submit any of your essays, if you're doing it online. If you're doing it in person, don't bring the checklist. You'll get in trouble. That would be a problem. But here again, is just a copy of the checklist. All of this, 25 minutes of review to remind you that you've got this. You don't need to stay up until midnight cramming. You don't need to make yourself crazy. What you need to do is just really trust yourself that you're going to be okay because you have prepared and you have looked at review videos and you have gotten a good night's sleep and you've eaten a good breakfast and you have dressed for success because if you wear pajamas to the test, your brain is like, oh, I am sleepy. Whereas if you wear something with like, I don't know, a button and some zippers, right? Your brain's like, okay, time to work. I better sit up straight, right? Little things like that to kind of psych your mind out and get you in the right frame of mind. But tomorrow's test day, guys, and you're going to be fantastic. Just trust yourself. It's going to be super. Okay. So that is where I land. John, are you still here? I am still here. Yay. And actually, Heather, I'm live on TikTok right now, too. I got 54 shiny people in here. Nice. A couple hundred who are with us on YouTube. And I want to just Yay. thank you all for spending your time with us tonight and wish you all the best of luck going into this test. It can be very stressful. Just like Heather was saying, there's no reason to be stressed out. There's no reason to feel overwhelmed by any of this. Um, we're here on this YouTube channel. I want to show you all on this YouTube channel, the playlist that we linked to earlier, um, because it's got 40 videos. So if you are at all overwhelmed, I'm going to take you here right now, everyone, everywhere, everyone. Um, here's the live that we're in right now. We've got videos on the multiple choice for AP English Lit on the Marco Learning channel, a six part series on the poetry question, a review for digital exams, some great poems by Andrew Binger and Elena Vernon. We've got reviews um, on this channel for AP English Lit, as well as the literary argument uh, essay. And then this goes all the way down with additional videos. So check out this. Check out the free practice tests we have on our website. We have them in five subjects, Lang Lit. Um, we have them in Euro, APUSH, and also in US Gov. So that's at marcolearning.com. And these study guide packs are really cool. This is for our one for AP World, super helpful. This is the one for AP Lit. It's got uh, test day tips. And Heather, let's just zoom in right here. The night before, which is right Sleep. now, bro. <laughs> Sleep. You'll be at your mental best if you're well rested. Focus on getting enough sleep starting several nights before the test. You're not going to do well on the AP exams if you're cramming into the wee hours of the morning. Yeah. And also this a link to this sophistication point article, everyone, I put that in the chat. So Heather, let's remind these students, the ones that I'm talking to here on, um, on TikTok were asking me all about cameras being required. They're not. And everyone who's studying here with us live on YouTube be in touch with us. I encourage you, follow us here on this channel. Subscribe to this channel. We are going to be posting live reviews all through the summer and the fall. Um, and take care of yourselves. You, you can trust the skills you have. You're not going to dramatically change your score overnight. So thanks for joining. Um, Heather, have a great night. And I hope that all of our students do really well in this exam tomorrow.